Welcome back to the Foundations Study. Today we're going to continue our discussion of the church government. So if you remember last time we talked about the ministry of service and the ministry of mercy. So today we're going to talk about oversight and teaching and the spiritual qualifications of a person who is going to be in church government. So with this, let's go ahead and continue in looking at the oversight and the teaching. So the primary role in church government is to teach correct doctrine and guide people in the right path. It's not to put on a big show. It's not to bring in a lot of people. It's not to have all the hugest congregation in your town. It is to make sure that whatever people show up to your congregation... They have a knowledge of correct doctrine and that we are guiding them into the correct path. So have a look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So we talked about the dangers of this modern movement to do away with pastors and to talk instead about leaders. And we talked about the danger of this is that the leader's job is to guide people in a unified mission. The pastor's job is to direct them in the way that they should go. And those are two distinct differences. One of them's like, hey, everybody, we're going to pull in everybody and going, we want everybody going this way. We're going to make a deep impact. The problem is God may not have those plans for everybody there. The role of the pastor is to make sure that the people are operating within the constraints that God has given them, not to tell them which direction they're supposed to be going. There is a distinction there. Okay, so they are to teach with both correct words, but also with correct action. So this is where the concept of hypocrisy goes away. So look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elders and witnesses in the suffering of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that which is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but for, with eagerness." Nor yet did lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Okay, so there's so much in here. It's clearly targeted to the elders, to the overseers, to the pastors and the teachers. To you, he says. All right, and then the fellow elders, sufferers of Christ, partakers of the glory. He, then he tells them, here's the explicit command. Shepherd the flock of God among you. A shepherd's job was to keep the sheep within the pastor. Let them do what they want within the constraints that they are given. The constraints we are given are the scriptures. Okay, it says exercise oversight, not under compulsion. Don't compel them to follow your vision-casted leader, but voluntarily according to the will of God. Not for gain, but with eagerness. Not lording it over. I'm the leader. I'm the one in charge. You cannot question the vision God gave me, but proving an example to the flock. All right, so that is really what that role is, to guide people in both correct doctrine and in correct living. So the role of teaching is to be specifically aligned with the word, not with people's own pleasures or desires, or I'll throw in there, the vision. This vision is something that we are... We have too much talk about vision in churches and not enough talk and discussion about doctrine and proper living before Christ. All right, so let's talk about avoiding pleasure. 2 Timothy 4.3 For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers according to their own desires. 
So this is kind of going on and happening in our modern world where we will seek out the people that say the things we want to hear rather than align ourselves to what the Word of God says. That's why it's more important to spend time in Bible study than it is seeking out a pastor to teach you. Spend that time in the scriptures and understand what the scriptures actually say. Unfold those things. Read good books on the subject. Read differing books on the subject that disagree with each other. Figure out which one is more in alignment with the scripture based upon supporting verses. Don't seek out somebody that will tickle your ears in hearing what you want to hear. Gather real teachers who will unashamedly teach what is in the Bible even to their own detriment. It's talking about correct doctrine. 1 Timothy 6.3 If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with a doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has morbid interests in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arrive envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions and constraint friction between men of a depraved mind and deprived of truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. That was uh, verses 3 through 5. So we want to have the correct doctrine. What is correct doctrine? This is why we uh, must understand the scriptures. We must take the time to examine anybody, whether it's me or your pastor or any other teacher that you find. You always examine what they say and see how it aligns with the scripture. That is what is important. And also, of course, how to handle the word of God. Remember those concepts of of rightly dividing the word of God. That might be the verse we're going to. I don't remember. Uh, We're going to look at Titus 1.9. Hold fast to the faithful word, which is in accordance with teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So handling the word of God is about being able to open up the scriptures, being able to identify some of the some of the errors in the way. So of course I wrote the book, The Art of Shallow Neighboring. This is the one I put zero marketing into and it's my best selling books. Presumably because a lot of people go out and, you know, in their churches, they're going through this Art of Neighboring program and then they're finding the book and reading it. And the number of people who leave me one star reviews on the book and, and, I, and I weep over these issues. Not that I got bad reviews, I don't care about that. I weep over the fact that people can read The Art of Neighboring and not be able to rightly discern the word of God. It was in a blasphemous garbage. It had 12 verses and, excuse me, had 16 verses in the book and 12 of them were completely misinterpreted. It pushed people towards a direction God would not have them go. It did not have the single gospel anywhere within it. It told people to align themselves with unbelievers to do the task of throwing block parties with no mention of the gospel and specific mention of engaging in activities which the scriptures specifically forbid. I'm telling you what, and pastors across America are putting their congregations through the art of neighboring. And every person I've sat across the table with, when they looked at this and said, well, what was wrong with the book? And I asked every single one of them, have you read it? The answer for all of them was no. We are behind our churches who are giving us damnable doctrines, books of heresy, telling us that's the way we should go. We are not being shepherded correctly. We're not being shepherded in the word of God. We are not rightly dividing the scriptures. And that is our task to do, to rightly Divide the scriptures. So that is oversight and teaching. Look for a shepherd, not a leader. Because God might have different directions for you to go. And you need a person who will teach you where the boundaries are. Not a person who tells you what you should do. All right. So let's talk uh, shift gears here. And let's talk about spiritual qualifications. Spiritual qualifications. There are 10 qualifications of elders, and they are listed throughout two sections of scripture. 
Uh, one of these is in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and one of these is going to be in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. So just like we did the spiritual gifts, let's go ahead and just read both of those verses, and then we're going to identify which all of these are. Let's go ahead and start in Titus because we are already in the book of Titus. So Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. All right, so the second section, which lists qualifications of elders, is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free of the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he be able to take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become disconceited or fall into condemnation incurred by the devil." And he must have good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. So extracted from these two blocks of scripture, looking at the overseers and qualifiers, let's have a look at the 10 qualifications that are listed in one or both of these sections. So blameless and above reproach. So this means to have a good reputation in the world and in the church. It's critical because elders are people who are most in front of the world. So in other words, and a good elder, they don't just have a reputation of being good in the church, but they can't be seen as a conceited jerk to the outside world. Like, that guy's like, that guy's a Christian guy, you know, and everyone talks about it behind his back. No, he's got to be the first person people go to because he's the most reliable. He's the most dependable. He's the most loving, whether or not you agree with his faith. That is what it means to be blameless and above reproach. So we should seek to be blameless and above reproach, whether or not we're seeking those offices or not. The husband of one wife and children under his subjection. In other words, the control of the family. So this will indicate an ability to handle one's family, which also means he should be able to manage the church family. Remember that the parable of the talents that Jesus tells. You know, the the one who is is shown the most faithful is given more responsibility. And the one who is shown the least faithful is given no responsibility. And then he goes on to mention, he who is capable of handling a little will be capable of handling a lot. He who is not capable of handling a little will not be able to handle anything else. And so we have to demonstrate that we are able to, dem to prove our own lives, prove our own management. Um, what if you're not married? Does this exclude you if you don't have a family? I don't specifically think it does because there's other factors you can do. Like, is your household under order or are you debt crazy, spend spendaholic out of control? You know, are you temperate with the things that you have? Are you... Are you surrounded by the things of the world and you take your pleasure in your stuff or you do you truly live yourself for the Christ. I think that those could be things. Some people would probably disagree with me on that, but eh, I'd be open to a discussion and a debate and have my mind changed on that. So temperate, sensible, and dignified. This is the third one. This means a balanced and mature interaction with the world. Do we run around a protesting abortion clinics? No, we don't. Don't waste your time. Preach the gospel in love instead. Be temper, be sensible, be dignified. Get out and have a good balance in the world. How about hospitable? This goes beyond opening up the home and resources, but also with a gladly willing heart. In other words, being hospitable doesn't just mean do you welcome people in. It also means are you available to help alleviate some problems and some challenges in this world. 
That is what they're talking about with hospitable. Able to teach. This is one because your elders and your overseers, these are not deacons. These are elders. These are teachers. These are the people who are responsible for, to guide and to shepherd the people in the right direction. They need to have this spiritual gift of being able to teach. The ability to teach is core to the function of the elder. So it is one trait that is not specifically shared with deacons. Deacons follow most of the rest of this list. But a deacon does not have the requirement to be able to teach. It's not their job to teach. It's their job to meet the physical needs. Not a drunkard, violent, quarrelsome, lover of money, or arrogant. These are all lumped in here together because these are the marks of people who do not get along well with others. Have a good conversation with a drunkard. Good luck. Um, violence, quarrelsome, lovers of money. These are, are all marks of, of people who are off balance. Not be a novice, all right? So a novice, in other words, not be a recent convert is what the list said in Timothy. An elder must be a mature believer, not a person who's re recent, recently converted. So this is to contrast many churches today who push new members and converts into a leadership role, hoping it will mature them. There's a big jump to this. Oh, you're now a Christian. The idea is let's, let's get them plugged in somewhere. A plugged in person will not leave the church as well. Plugging them in will help mature them. That is completely antithetical to what the scripture tells us to do. We have to demonstrate ourselves faithful and maintaining the habit of the spiritual disciplines over a period of time, transforming ourselves into the likeness of Christ. When we are able to do that, then what ends up happening is we can demonstrate that we are capable of managing our own spiritual life, and so then we will be able to help manage others. We should not be pushing new converts into positions of leadership. Sure, maybe push them help them out, you know, they can help somewhere else, but they should, they should never be given a position of leadership, which is scary in the light of the fact that a lot of our churches are now doing these facilitated Bible studies instead, where you're getting a guy who knows nothing about the scriptures in front. Oh, we, we need a leader. It's more of not a leader as much as a facilitator. Your task is just to put in the DVD and lead the discussion and carry you through there. Guys, that is why our American churches are failing. Because we are putting people in these positions of leadership that do not understand the scriptures. We have to stop doing that and appoint people who actually know the scriptures. All right, a positive reputation in the community. This kind of goes up to that temperate, sensible, and dignified. So this is the person who the outside world respects them. They, are not, they do not look down at people who are of different faiths or religions or no religions. They're not holier than thou art. They are people who are legitimately have a good reputation among the world. Okay, love goodness, master himself, upright and holy. These are all under these spiritual discipline things. To love things that are right, desiring things that are right. This is not the guy who's going home and watching all of the worst stuff on television not really paying attention to a scripture, not spending time in prayer life. But instead, this is the person, they love the things that are right. They are disciplining themselves to have godly character. Uh, the, there's the fabulous um, play of sanctification. It's in, uh, I believe it's in uh, 2 Peter 1 or 1 Peter 2. It's right around there where it's this whole progression of, of things. And the entire concept of it is that what we need to do, it's in uh, 2 Peter um, chapter 1, starting in verse 5 down through 11. We're not going to read it here. Um, but it's just, it's this whole thing that, that it's, it is our task to get out and actually do these things, actually work hard at our spiritual growth. And then hold firm to the shore word. Have faith and believe in God, even when secular theories contradict the word. Secular theories come up. People are like, oh, I can't believe that. You know, the science has proven otherwise. Uh, science doesn't prove anything, people. Science will demonstrate some things under certain circumstances. But the scripture is the infallible word of God. Okay? So dis even if these issues come up, even if these, these challenges come up, do we have enough confidence in our God to not be swayed by the theories of the world, which would announced to disprove him, even though they really don't.
So those are your spiritual qualifications. Let me know your thoughts on all of those. Uh, once again, you can help support the channel. Have a look at the links in the description down below. You can join me on thinklifemedia.com if you want to help support the channel financially. Also, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash T-O-M-M. Links for all that is in the description down below. You can pick up The Art of Shallow Neighboring pretty much anywhere you, where you pick up books. Uh, Amazon, uh, you can find it over there. You can get it directly from my store at rwalkinchrist.com, and I have some other books you can look at as well. So thanks for coming along, and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk in our Lord.